Miss Celia C. Peters, and I am currently a, an artist in residence at the Center for Afrofuture Studies at Public Space One. And I am a filmmaker and visual artist, and I'm very, very excited and very pleased to be able to present this panel um, in conjunction with CAS. And CS One, Black Women Are the Future. I have some really exciting people that I will be in conversation with today, and I can't wait to present their immense creativity and intellect and innovation. So with that, I will talk a little bit about how this panel came to be. I conceived this panel because I wanted to have a meaningful, conscious, and very clear conversation about the pivotal role of black women in science fiction. I, I work primarily in the sci-fi genre as a filmmaker and also as a visual artist. And I really wanted to talk about the role of black women in science fiction as it relates to the significance of sci-fi as a harbinger of what lies ahead. As we know, the best of sci-fi is prescient and it is driven by innovators. Black women have a legacy of not only being the nurturers of everyone in the world, we also have contributed creative, technological, and scientific innovations that have shifted society in tangible and extremely meaningful ways. We don't always get credit for that, but that is the fact nonetheless. Afrofuturism in particular was a term that was first coined in 1993 by a writer named Mark Derry. He defined it as speculative fiction that treats African-American themes and addresses African-American concerns in the context of 20th century technoculture, and more generally, African-American signification that appropriates images of technology and a prosthetically enhanced future. It's a very interesting definition. Um, since that time, of course, th that definition of Afrofuturism has evolved. My own definition is that Afrofuturism is an exploration of diasporic futures from an Afrocentric perspective. It is a state of mind, it's a point of view, and a corresponding way of moving through the world, which happens in the arts, in literature, in design, socially, and politically. The through lines are a love for and respect of blackness, and an orientation toward what lies ahead, absent of the limits that are imposed by outside forces. And so again, the basis of Afrofuturism for me is an unapologetic love of blackness, which leaves no room for self-hate. Afrofuturism is that state of mind that expresses itself in all of these facets of creativity. As we know, America is a patriarchal society with deep roots in racism and misogyny. There are great things about this country. There are great things about this country, but right now we find ourselves in a political and social climate that is striving to bolster the country's unfortunate beginnings. But I find that those efforts are at cross purposes with reality. As time goes on and humanity rides the momentum of the technologies that we've created, black women are not going to devolve. We're not going to devolve misogyny and racism notwithstanding. We have never devolved. We keep moving forward. And for me, science fiction and Afrofuturism are major pathways for that movement forward. For the past couple of years, I've been thinking a lot about Lucy. I started thinking about her because of a pattern that I noticed in this country. It's sort of a very insidious pattern. A pattern where black women's authentic beauty and power is being muted, distorted, or downright erased in media. And media for me, media is kind of my playground. And so I noticed it there, um, I noticed it there first. Again, this has happened before. You know, it's happened historically where everything that is ascribed to blackness and in a country where for women beauty is seen as this, your, your sort of entree and your value, for black women our beauty has always been 
described as non-beauty. In life, though, along with this pattern, I've noticed that black women have increasingly been the targets of violence and other kinds of hostility, both state-sponsored and in our own communities. Lucy came to my mind because the bitter irony struck me that she is the earliest human ancestor known to us, a female who originated on the continent of Africa. And I wondered how have we gotten to this point where black women are the object of such scorn, contempt, and hostility. Pretty quickly, I lost interest in the how, and I began to focus on what to do about it. For me as a creator, sci-fi is a genre of liberation. It's a direct pathway to an unwritten future. And the future, as we know, can be whatever we want it to be. While here in my residency at CAS, I'm creating the first three episodes of an audio drama called Domesticated. This series is based on a short story of the same title, which I wrote, and Domesticated is the story of Araminta, who finds herself in a new reality, where life is now controlled by a race of powerful, advanced aliens who've invaded Earth and subjugated humanity for a purpose that only they understand. In this harsh new world, humans are now glorified pets, and the planet itself is unrecognizable. People cannot communicate with their bizarre new keepers, but the aliens seem to know everything about people, except their will to be free. Araminta and fellow strangers Lopez and Ziamara are thrown together in the same impossible situation. Each one sees a different way out but not everyone is letting on. And at the end of the day, they all need each other if any one of them is going to make it. I am very grateful and very excited to have connected with an organization like the Center for Afrofuture Studies and Public Space One, to have the kind of support that they give for the, not only my vision, but the vision, visions of others who are seeing things from this perspective who are looking forward with a, an attitude and a spirit of pride and creativity and innovation and determination is amazing. I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm very glad that others will be able to experience it as well. And I'm also very glad to have been able to invite the two women who are going to be on the panel with me here. I am a filmmaker, an artist, a lover of science, a future, a futurist, sorry, and an optimist. And I rebuke racism, chauvinism, misogyny. So here we are. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you all so much for joining us here. My name is Anne Duplan, um, and together with Kalmia Strong and John Engelbrecht, uh, we run the Center for Afrofuture Studies at Public Space One. Um, we're so, so happy to have Celia Peters here and to also have Ingrid and Sheree here for what we know is going to be an amazing conversation. Um, and we want to let you know that you can continue to follow what we're doing by signing up for our mailing list. Uh, our excellent CAS fellow, uh, Tiffany Tucker, is putting on a salon if you like dancing. Uh, it'll be going on in the next, uh, I think in April, but uh, you can find out kind of exact details about that by following us on Facebook or joining that mailing list. Uh, and then next spring we'll have an exhibition up at Public Space One uh, by curator Jamila Hinson. So just keep tabs and it's, it's amazing to see you all here today. Um, and before we get to the, the content of the program, I also just want to thank, thank you again for coming and also thank um, a number of funders and other folks who have supported this and made it possible. Um, so uh, we're really grateful to the Media The Foundation, the Black Art Futures Fund, 
Legacies for Iowa, a University of Iowa Stanley Museum of Art collection sharing project supported by the Matthew Buxbaum family and to Lauren Haldeman for being visionary supporters of this year and last year's CAST program. We also want to say special thanks to Little Village Magazine, Java House, the Iowa Writers House, the University of Iowa Libraries, and to the public library here, all of whom have been incredibly helpful um, putting this together. And um, I can't name everyone, but I also want to say thank you to all of our volunteers and especially to Tiffany, um, yes. because this is really a community effort. So, round of applause for that. Further ado, we bring you the reason that you all came here. <laughs> so I'm doing, I'm sorry. I just the so I'm going on this open first, right? Yes. Before me. Okay. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the women who are joining me here on this on this panel. Um, and I was asked why I selected these participants. And um, coming up with answers was not difficult at all. Um, I talked about this program with An, Palmina, and John, and over you know a number of months. And I realized that I really wanted to engage women on this panel who were doing something different than what I do. Um, because Afrofuturism and science fiction really as a, as a mindset is not limited to one genre or medium or platform. It is a state of mind. It's a way of seeing the world and to me it's a way of being. And so I thought about you know, who's doing this in ways that are very different than the way that I'm doing it. And so we have these, these, these powerful, lovely and amazing women. Cherie Renee Thomas is a prolific writer. She's an author, a poet, and an editor. She has a highly analytical mind, and she's steeped in storytelling that comes from a place of reverence for the fullness of black culture, including its mystical roots, and an embrace of the future. For me, the combination of what she brings to the table is reflective of the essence of Afrofuturism. It's an understanding that none of the aspects of the diasporic legacy are in conflict. Science, rational thought, spirit, and creativity not only coexist, but strengthen each other. Ingrid LaFleur is a powerful social technologist and futurist who is also an artist in her own right and a curator who can present the artistic visions of others. She is a founder, the founder of a multimedia, cu multimedia curatorial project called Afrotopia, which is based in Detroit. <coughs> Afrotopia draws on science fiction, black history, technology, social change, and creativity in Detroit and in the world. Ingrid was also a mayoral candidate in her city of Detroit, and she brought a progressive, visionary, futurist perspective to politics. She is someone who is bringing a forward-looking, expansive, and innately Afrocentric perspective to real lives in social technology, in the arts, in activism, and in the political arena as well. So who better to have this conversation with? Now, we will go on to, each one of us is going to give you a short presentation and give you a taste of what we each do. So I'm going to start with, with mine, and that will be with um, my
No second chance, no more time. Oh God, oh my God. I'm going to. Flip sides of the Black Musical Experience will present two of the many unexpected chapters in the African American musical side opera and punk rock. Through the lens of the black artist, both opera and punk share an outsider cast that attracts creative spirits marching to the beat of their own drum. This program begins with a song first. Matilda Cicero joins us to drum. On the other side of opera's opera is the gritty discontent of punk rock. Segment two of this program highlights a revolutionary black band from the Motor City, Jeff.
Richard Mind Expansion Level 1 Program Grammar Module, English Version. How are you? Fine, I'm good. You? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> this program is, is, is property of, of, of Expansion Corporation. <laughs> program creator, creator, Roxanne P. Jones. Dr. Robinson. Roxy. characters and stories that reflect the world that I know in both film and visual art. I was blessed to grow up with, with parents and an extended family that did not subscribe to society's ideas of what people should be or do based on gender or race. I was raised to have a free mind. I've always been draw, uh, drawn to the metaphysical and the possibilities of the unseen. But my parents were quantitative people whose careers were based on science and logic. So those are also an ingrained part of me. I grew up seeing one of my aunts, who was a visual artist, she was an oil painter, and she had a studio, and she showed and sold her work. She had black artist friends. So this was all a part of my status quo. And much later, I did graduate work in clinical psychology, which completely, actually, before I say that, I did graduate work in clinical psychology and I also worked in social services, in social work. And both of those things completely shifted and elevated my understanding of people, of motivation and behavior. And I was hooked. The result of all of this is that my work is character driven and it reflects my fascination with the interface of the scientific and the spiritual, with energy being the nexus. Both for me are quite real. And I also find that technology is a conduit for both. These are some of the pieces of my visual art. Um, I will go back and say this piece is called The Eyes Have It. And the subject of this is a woman who lived, it was in the 1930s um, on the continent of Africa. And I'm not sure which country actually but her, her gaze struck me, of course. Um, I can't imagine what she was thinking, seeing someone point a camera at her and take a picture. This piece is called Wished on the Moon, and it is a portrait that for me portrays the beauty, the absolute beauty and power of Billie Holiday, who's always been one of my heroines. And this piece is called Destiny. Destiny 2, actually. And for me, this is a reflection of black people as we are, free in the cosmos, full of joy, and rushing toward the source of all greatness. And finally, the project that I am currently working on is my feature film, my first feature film, which is called Godspeed. And Godspeed is a near future story about a woman named Brandy. And Brandy is a mathematically inclined woman. She's living in New York, very successful. Um, she's actually working as a tech editor, but she's inspired to create an algorithm. And this is just what she was inspired to do on her own time. And she 
For her, the algorithm will elevate her company to the next level. But she becomes obsessed with it. She becomes obsessed with completing and perfecting this algorithm, and her mind starts to fall apart to the point where she has a very a disastrous meltdown and has to leave her job for a while. She has to take a leave, which for her is devastating because her career is really the point of her identity. She goes from New York to her family's home in Ohio, and despite the fact that her family is very loving, um, she continues to get worse. Things keep escalating. Her perceptions of reality are distorted. She's having auditory hallucinations that no one else hears, things that no one else hears. And she gets to the point where someone that she loves and trusts, someone who is her seven-year-old little brother, tells her that the problem is not that she's going crazy. The problem is related to the fact that she's not human. And the only way that she can survive what's happening to her is to go to a world that she has no knowledge of. And as time goes on, she has to make a choice. And I will not tell you what choice she makes, but <laughs> that is the story of Godspeed. Um, I'm very excited about this project. It has been a haul, and for me, well worth all of the effort and the time and the work that's gone into it. And right now, we are, you know, we're, we're financing the film and we're packaging it, but I have no doubt whatsoever that this film will be done and it will be made and you will see it. So, without further ado, I will pass the mic and the podium over to Ms. Cherie Thomas. <laughs> for thinking of me and bringing me to this wonderful space. I had no idea that it was the Center for Afrofuturist Studies, so that is amazing. I told everyone I know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be surprised if you're inundated with applications for residency. Um, I would love to move this a little bit further forward. Oh, <laughs> All right, I am a writer. Storytellers in Memphis, Tennessee. I believe in the genius culture that's created in the Mississippi Delta. I believe the future can be found down south or up south, as the editor Lila E. Gerbero says. We can find the future there. We are there creating it right now. Um, my work is published by a feminist science fiction publisher in Seattle, um, After Dark Press. So the newest collection is Sleeping Under the Tree of Life. Um, my first one is Shotgun Lullaby. I'm probably, probably better known for two anthologies I edited. Um, I started working on Dark Matter back in 1998, and it was published by Warner Books in 2000, and it was the 100 years of black science fiction. I'm going to talk a little bit about that legacy. Black women are the future, and we have always been a part of that creation of that future. So those are the two collections, two World Fantasy Awards, I don't know if you got my ad, <laughs> and the writers have gone on to win the Pulitzer Prize, to become National Book Award finalists, and to just be absolutely amazing. Um, the title of my little talk today is Rehearsing the Future. Rehearsing the Future. I've been blessed to be around theater people. Um, and one of the, um, one of the best um, that I know is an amazing writer, science fiction writer herself. She is a master science fiction novelist. She is a playwright. And she's a scholar. She teaches at Smith College. Her name is Andrea V. Hairston. And this comes from one of her quotes. She says, you have to rehearse the future. We have to dance life. And um, I really believe in that. This is a little bit about activism, Afrofuturism, and black representation. Bell Hook says, the function of art is to do more than to tell it like it is. It's to imagine what is possible. So we have to move beyond just realism to talk about what it is that we imagine, what is the change we want to see in that world. And in order to create that change, you have to be able to imagine it. You have to be able to imagine it. Um, we have been talking about uh, black lives in science fiction for a, a long time. But when I started working in book publishing, of course, the common idea that there were only maybe two science fiction writers, maybe three, and that third person would change. So it was Samuel R. Delaney, Tyra Lear, um, also Octavia E. Butler. And then that third person might have been Stephen Barnes, might have been Charles Saunders, it might have been Jewel Goldman. It just depended on who you ask. But they didn't think we existed, which is why 
I came up with the concept of dark matter on the NASA Jet Propulsion website. I was tooling around in there. And it seemed like a fitting metaphor for black contribution in science fiction and beyond. Um, of course, Amir Baraza was thinking about this during the Black Arts Movement. And Malisi Asante just, um, uh, I just uh, met with him in Berlin. And he said, it's, in his opinion, he was a person, one of the many people like Tanya Chung Sen, Ishmael Reed, and others who were a part of that Black Arts Movement, that Afrofuturism is the Black Arts Movement uh, today. So I thought that was a pretty amazing um, statement, and I concur. Um, Provo Science Fiction Pioneers. Um, I said Black Future can be found in the South. Well, we have Martin R. Delaney, who uh, was a preacher who was also in Memphis and Texas, who created Blake or the Hunts of America in 1859. We have also Freddie E. Griggs, who imagined a free, free um, black state um, that came out of a love story of all things. Um, the black man and his wife, his wife was sold away into slavery, and he went and created a whole revolution to free her from Cuba and other places and created an alternate uh, black state in Texas, all right? Wrote that in 1899. And then, of course, black woman here, always underappreciated, mm -hmm. always undersighted, Pauline Hawkins, who uh, was born in 1859, the year that Martin Delaney published Blake or the Hunts of America. And she published her story, 1900, 1900, 1901, 1902, in the Colored uh, American Magazine of One Blood. And she's imagining um, a young black um, scholar who doesn't know anything about Africa other than how to uh, profit from it, who ends up in um, Ethiopia on a journey of his life and learns a lot more than he bargained for. Um, that was what we would consider Provo Science Fiction. She published it back at a time when we weren't even considered human. Okay? And of course, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, which we all know for his you know, Souls of Black Folk scholarship and also um, leading us into sociology, creating that field. But he also wrote classic science fiction. And um, it was in Dark Matter where I first introduced that idea. I just couldn't believe that no one had discussed it before. He had written, to my knowledge at that time, two science fiction stories. And since um, Dark Matter was published, it's going to be the 20th anniversary next year, they have found a third one in his archive. So that's something to think about as well. The pioneers Octavia E. Butler, Kindred, recently adapted by Damien, excuse me, Damien uh, and J John Jennings, Damien Duffy and John Jennings. And they're actually, I think, working on the second one, Parable of the Sower, as well. This is of her work. This is one of the first people I actually think about when I think of black women in science fiction. I think of Octavia E. Butler, who is basically the godmother of so many uh, black women writing today. We're gonna talk a little bit about those amazing women as well. Um, this is Sister Letha Clarion. I got a chance to study with her. And if you look up ahead, you see a, a Sister with shades in the middle. That's Andrea D. Harrison. <laughs> Of course, they thought we didn't read or write science fiction. I want to talk about this. So, people who are doing extraordinary work in science fiction today: Adrian Marie Brown, Ramita Imaresh, Amarisha, um, Detroit, and Portland, Oregon. Um, they did a collection called Octavia's Brood, which was taking science fiction and fantasy works of the social justice movement. They gathered all these amazing writers together and put them in one book, um, and they were using Octavia Butler's work from Parable of the Sword, that series, and this idea of earth seed and creating change. And they used it as a model of social work to do, to address real problems in their community. So that's something that I think is just extraordinary. Something that we weren't talking about in the early 90s, um, after uh, Barbary coined the term, and after um, Alondra um, Nelson actually brought it up into a popular format for everyone to think about on her Afrofuturism net. Um, Lister that she created with so many other artists and creators. So that's Adrian and Lamita. Do look for their work. Um, the other idea that came out of the Octavius Brood collection was this idea that all organizing is science fiction. And if you think about any protest movement, any activities that are happening in the black community, the first people you see 
are black women. There's a saying we have in the South, you want to build a church, you got to find 12 women. 12 women will make you a church. Well, 12 women will build you a future, okay? <laughs> so if you can imagine a world without poverty, a world without homelessness, prison industrial complex, without police brutality, without borders, without oppression, domestic violence, environmental racism, or war, guess what? You have just imagined a science fictional world. People who are doing exciting work. That includes Alexis Pauline Gums. She has multiple titles, but the one that I'm so in love with right now is her M Archive. Got the pleasure of being able to publish a little bit of it in Obsidian, the literature and arts um, of the African Diaspora Journal, which I'm an uh, associate editor for. It's based out of Illinois State University. And in it, she has a feminist from the future who is going back through the rubble of society to, ex to explain what happened to the world. And she's going through black women's aesthetics and black women's um, view, view of the world, actually, to piece together that, uh, that information. And it's simply an amazing um, experience. It's multimedia and form, and you should definitely look for that. Emergent Strategy being used all over the country in nonprofit organizations. Um, it was created by Adrienne Marie Brown. She now has her pleasure principal book that she's doing as well, which um, Ingrid's gonna, maybe going to talk about because she's featured in it as well. <laughs> and of course, um, Andrea Harrison, and this is just uh, her most recent novel, Will Do Magic for Small Change, and she has a new one coming out through Tori.com. I always mention Walter Mosley. He's not a black woman, <laughs> but he loves black women. And you know that from his writing, you know that from his art, um, in particular this collection, Future Land, which I think is totally unappreciated, under review, uh, thank you, thank you, <laughs> under celebrated and definitely needs to be explored more. And I think it's underappreciated because it imagines some of the things that we're talking about. Because a black future where people are thriving, not just surviving, where it's not just aesthetics, it's not just Janelle Monet, dress fly, you know? <laughs> It's actually, you know, it's not like theoretical architectural, you know, experiments, but actually creating healthy black communities that, that aren't exploited, that aren't disinvested, that are aesthetically beautiful, that work and create whole people and whole families. That's not a project everybody wants to get on. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Um, so it's not something um, that people want to, to think about. And he does the mind experiments in that book. Maybe a core for. Who Fears Death? This is my favorite, or was my favorite novel by her. Um, I'm, I'm really in love with Lagoon as well. Lagoon is really wonderful. But she is a Nigerian American um, writer who is just doing extraordinary things in her fiction. So do check her out. And When the World Wounds, Ki'ini Ibura Salam, which is published by Third Man Books, is another amazing writer that I think that everyone on the earth <laughs> should be reading just because of not only just her lyricism and writing and the economy of prose that she has, but in her sensuality. Because how are you going to have a black future and you don't have black love? How are you going to have a black future if you're scared to show a black man and a black woman on the scene together in the future? Think about the movies you've seen. There's usually one black man, and you don't see him connected to the black community at all, or one black woman, and the same thing is for her. But showing actual black, healthy, loving couples, that's a science fictional act in and of itself. But I'm told there's something I should be watching, so we'll be talking about that. And of course, right now, Nora K. Jemison, N.K. Jemison, I see all this like white applause in the audience, <laughs> who is just making history by merely doing her work. She has an extraordinary mind, and she has a great love for us, for all of us. And that's the thing about black women in the future. We love the world. We love everyone. If you take care of the people at the bottom, you're going to help everyone in the entire society. So I'm just going to end with Nora K. Jemison right there. But I will thank you all for having me. How are you guys doing today? Good? Uh, good. <laughs> How are you doing? We're talking about afternoon. Yes. Good, good. 
Awesome. So, I am Ingrid LaFleur. Uh, I'm a big lover of Afrofuturism, and I've enjoyed this journey that Celia and uh, Sheree put, put us through because it brought back all the memories of being on the listserv uh, that Alondra Nelson put together and uh, just experiencing the evolution of Afrofuturism. Uh, I've been a big fan probably right after it was coined, I've been involved. And one of the things that I've always been interested in was the imagination part, just the, the freedom to imagine black bodies in all these different spaces. And so uh, about seven, eight years ago, I moved back to Detroit and curator and decided to create Afrotopia because all the futures were being crafted aggressively still by white men, and Detroit is 85% black. Uh, so I thought Afrofuturism has to be present, but I really didn't know how it should show up. And it started with teaching people what, about Afrofuturism, what it is, and really introducing it to Detroit, and really understanding that I'm not necessarily bringing Afrofuturism or really introducing people to Afrofuturism. What I'm doing is awakening, awakening the Afrofuturist within you. Uh, it's already there. Uh, and it's just kind of like a reminder, or, oh, there's a name for that, or there's a whole community of people that I can find because of this label. But as Sheree has um, definitely pointed out, we've always been Afrofuturist. But the question is, when you're in a majority black city and you're dealing with deep poverty, how am I gonna be asking beautiful children to imagine any sort of future? They're walking through neighborhoods that are decimated. Uh, there's litter everywhere, abandoned homes that are extremely dangerous, just sitting there rotting because the owners refuse to do anything or they're waiting for the market to change. When children are living without water, in Detroit they're cutting off water by the thousands. Thousands, okay? Uh, so, you know, as a curator, I'm coming in like, let's imagine all these black futures, and people are like, I don't have no water. <laughs> so that kind of shifts things, right? Just a little. Nothing major. So what I what ended up happening was I became, of course, deeply concerned about what's going on. Really looked to the social justice community to inform me because that's something that we have to always remember. There's always somebody working on the problem. There's someone who's already thought of a solution. So it's really about either. I don't know, tweaking the solution or supporting that. And I was more in the mode of supporting that. And that's why I ran for mayor of Detroit. In that process, oh man, that's a process. Um, <laughs> I became acutely aware of the economic problem. And that's where I am today. And this is what I'm gonna be talking about. Securing black futures. I love this quote by Audre Lorde. I am a pleasure activist, and I'm in um, Adrienne's amazing book. She interviewed me, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, pleasure, for me, should be part of every moment of every day. And black bodies for centuries had been denied that access to that pleasure. We weren't supposed to be sensual beings with desire and joy, delight. We're not supposed to play and do all of these things. So whenever we engage in those acts, it's already a rebellious act. And it really reinforces our existence in that we're human beings, which society is still kind of on the fence about. So, you know, when we're thinking about economics, then where is the pleasure? Because right now we're in that survival mode. And how do we get to the thriving mode, right? Because survival mode, we're, we're barely making that survival mode. Um, but to do that, we're working two jobs. Um, we're worried about our kids getting from school back home because I'm still working, it's cold, my child might not have a coat, I might not have food, we might have to go to the food pantry after school. All kinds of things are happening, right? So it's a struggle just to make it to this one point. And then you don't have a system that's actually supporting you. So that causes problems. So I've been trying to think about, huh, I still did it. <laughs> I've been trying to think about like what are these tools that we actually need? Because I, I kind of, you know, it's one thing to, to think about different policies, you know, that can be go into effect, 
Um, but have they been econo economically viable for black bodies? And for me, the answer has been no. Um, they have been helpful in certain ways to help us to get to just, just, a, just a little bit above <laughs> to rival mode. But I really feel like right now, this is our moment to really see what we can actually create. So before we get to that point, I just kind of want to talk about our current economic system. This is a piece by Philandus um, Dame. And I like it because I do think that the current economic system is quite thuggish. It's a bully kind of situation. It's forcing us to participate in a system that basically um, distances us from resources. So we're always managing. We're not part of the ecology. We're not part of this beautiful ecosystem. We're just managing these forests, just managing these waters. And they're just supposed to just serve us for however long we want, even if we pollute them. Everything is transactional, and that's what Audrey Lord was talking about. It's just a transaction. It's all about the profits. We're all about debt. Our entire economy is based on debt. Um, the problem is, is that when you're lower income, you're swallowed by that debt. It's not necessarily something that you can use for your benefit when you're wealthy. That's what happens. You can trade on it. You can do all kinds of things with it. And it's all about profits before people. It encourages overconsumption. Please buy, 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 and please stay in debt. And jobs, jobs, jobs. This is the thing that really makes me angry. When politicians talk about, talk about jobs, I go crazy. Go to Detroit. You can see what jobs actually did. It's not sustainable. It's not secure. If you lose your job, most of us are without the savings to actually be able to look for the next job. We don't necessarily have family members to rely upon because their jobs are only giving them so much money. We're still talking about working poor, right? Working poor means you still can't make it. So if you lose your job, then you're, you're <laughs> you could be homeless, right? So I, I do not believe jobs are the answer. So this current economic system has created this. What do you think 228 years means? It will take 228 years for the average black American family to accrue the wealth of the average white American family. Let that sink in. 228 years. How many generations is that? Jesus, I don't even want to do that. So, and that's, how we, that's where it is today. But whites are still accruing wealth. I don't know. Are we... Are we moving along with them? Is the gap growing? I suspect that the gap is probably growing. And we're just talking about black American families compared to white American families. We haven't talked about the rest, Hispanic families, so on and so forth. The wealth gap is very, very large. At the exact same time, though, we do have this like really wonderful statistic when it comes to black women. Black women, our companies, the a number of companies that we created grew by 258% between 1997 and 2013. And those businesses generated $44.9 billion in revenue in 2013. That's amazing. That's great, right? Yeah. But at the exact same time, the poverty rates for black women who lead uh, families is 38%. One in four black women are uninsured. The poverty rate for black women as we age increases. So as much as we're doing as much as we can to contribute and participate in this wonderful economic system of ours, <laughs> um, there's so many of us who are still struggling. So how do we close that gap? So we can look at economic liberation, uh, and that for me looks like this, cooperative economics, uh, universal basic income, which I advocated for, uh, and this use of blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. And this is what I work in now. Uh, the reason, well first, before I get into this, so I don't confuse you because most people don't really have an understanding of blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is the tech behind cryptocurrency. It's what makes cryptocurrency so secure, and that's why people like it. Blockchain technology is literally a digital ledger, um, like a Google sheet, 
that anybody can contribute to, cannot edit, but everyone has access to and it's transparent. I like this. The transparency is very necessary in so many different areas. So if you think about government and their budget and participatory budget systems, um, and it's decentralized, which means that there are copies all over the world being held by different machines, right? So that means that the machine in Detroit, if you want to bomb it, like you want to bomb you know, the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it won't matter because the copies of that information is all around the world. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer system, which means we don't have to deal with banks, which have cost us, uh, which have, causes blockages in our economic growth. Um, and any other, uh, any other kind of these third parties that kind of embed institutional racism in the way that they work. So now we, can, we don't have to deal with that and we can just do a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. But the problem is, is that a lot of our systems are being replicated within this new technology. Why? There's not enough diversity within the technology. So the capitalist nature kind of kind of seeps in to this, this tech and how it's actually created. It's embedded in that. And this is something new for me. I'm only a year into, uh, really? Oh, man. Okay, so I'm only a year into technology, so I'm, I'm understanding that we have to go deeper. And how do we go deeper? With these Afrofuturist kinds of principles. And I just pulled this from all the material that you were just presented. We need a type of radical love um, that moves beyond any sort of framework that society has given us. We need ancestral gravity. We need the wisdom of our ancestors when we're creating this tech. Um, it has to be a co-creation. We need the diversity at the table. Um, the trust and transparency is present within blockchain technology, which I'm really happy about. The experimentation is always present. So one of the things, as much as we're looking at creating new parallel systems using cri cryptocurrency, we're also looking at new government models. And we're playing with that, and I'll get into it in two seconds. And then it has to be pleasurable. I believe in the cooperative economics. The resilience has to happen, and we always are evolving. Not revolving. So this is not a revolution, this is an evolution. Oh, this is wonderful free market uh, swap that happens in Detroit. And it's just an example of all of those principles kind of in one. This is a community thing where people bring, to have admission, you just bring one thing, you come in, you can choose as many things you want, and you can walk out the door. And this is how this person, Halima Cassell, also runs a time banking. So she's creating these alternative modes for supporting community. But then it's, it becomes a question, this is my company, how do we do that using technology? So I am working to create a decentralized autonomous community. It is literally like a digital cooperative. Why? Because we can co-design an economy because I have the token, that cryptocurrency. The co-designing of an economy is super, super exciting for me because it also means the co-designing of a government system to manage that and it's literally the people. It's no one else, just the people who decide to participate. Um, and I can talk about it more when we're doing a Q&A, but I have to stop talking. <laughs> but here's my information, and please let me know if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are going to have a little 
I'll chat now. <laughs> um, and now that you see what I mean about the minds that have joined me here, um, then you understand why I'm so excited to have this conversation. And as well, we're, very, we're definitely very interested in hearing from you. Um, right now, I'm going to start with a few questions that I had um, just to get us started. So I guess I'd like to ask each of you and jump in whichever one wants to answer first, what does Afrofuturism mean to you? I think we all sort of have our definitions um, that are influenced by, you know, sort of where we're focused and what we're doing, but I'm curious to hear from each of you, like what your definition, what it, what it means to you. All right, for me, Afrofuturism should be plural. It is a global movement, and this is something I've been thinking about for a while, mostly because I've been traveling a lot of um, outside of the United States and in places where they are having the same struggles but at a different level, um, at a different pace, and hearing a lot of different feedback from people in Europe, um, black people in different countries, and they have a totally different history um, than us in America, keeping in mind that the definition with looking at African American usage of technology in art, culture, etc. Um, that's where it started, the definition. But for me, it is um, Afrofuturism. It is um, a philosophy that people are constantly recreating and um, modifying and adapting based on where they are in the world and based on what are their specific issues. Um, so Afrofuturism in Memphis may look very different than Afrofuturism in Philadelphia and, or Afrofuturism in Berlin or in Birmingham, UK, or in um, Rome, very different. Um, or on the continent of Africa, okay, where um, Afrofuturism may be more about economic policies changing over time, not just the visual arts and culture and music and fashion. Um, so it's a philosophy. It is. It could be a way of life, or it could be multiple approaches to problem solving. It is creative problem solving. Um, the main thing that I've seen um, from its origins as a term or what have you is moving beyond translation of black culture to um, white majority. It's moving from being so subconscious about the white gaze and what it means, and um, in terms of academia, in terms of scholarship, it's rooted more in black communities. It is a grassroots, global um, movement that is has many different hands working on it. And um, we are resisting, I think, a rigid idea of what it is or what it should be. But it is almost always now centered by black people and what they think is important about what what their future is going to be, and also reimagining and revisiting what the past is, because you have to have the Sankofa approach to it. You cannot build the future if you don't have a sophisticated understanding, a truthful understanding of where you've been. That's really interesting that you say that, too, because for one, I just learned this morning that Mark Berry is white. <laughs> the writer who, who coined the phrase as yeah. a future. I didn't know that until today, honestly. <laughs> and so and so I knew about his article and all that, but I didn't realize that he was white. And so all along, for me, that definition has the, the agency, black people's agency is a core part of what Afrofuturism is. And I didn't, you know, I don't think that necessarily when he wrote it, whether regardless of whether he was white or black, it didn't really seem like that was part of it necessarily. He's a cultural critic. Right. At well, Punk Origins, I just learned, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Um, very interesting, interesting person. And we actually had a chance to talk about it because I had been holding my tongue for years. Because <laughs> I had so many questions about the article. Um, it's in his Flame Wars mm -hmm. um, book, a classic. Um, I was like, why did you only speak to Sammy Delaney? How did Trisha Rose get in the conversation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, Greg Tate is amazing, but what about Arthur Jaffa? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, Jill Gomez, all these other people, and um, and we talked about that in the Bronx Museum of Art at um, mm -hmm. the uh -huh. Black Speculative Arts Movement, uh -huh. um, which John uh, Jennings and um, Dr. Renato Anderson at Harris Stowe University created um, mm -hmm. out of their unveiling vision um, exhibit at the Schomburg in New York, 
And one of the things that he talked about was that he just didn't, you know, he didn't know. He tried to reach out to Octavia Butler and wasn't able to, to get her involved. And so he just reached out to who he was aware of because it was something he was observing. He recognized that it had been happening and he was just trying to put a, a term to it to try to describe what was happening. You know, but he's very open, very much a, a supporter and ally the way you should be an ally. He, I feel like he demonstrates that very beautifully. But I do think that the evolution of the definition has, has picked up this idea mm -hmm. of agency and just has sort of taken it and run with it and there's a momentum behind it. And I think that for certainly for younger people who are learning about Afrofuturism now, teenagers and people, you know, maybe not much older than teenagers, it's an intrinsically a part of it, that agency. So Ingrid, your what does Afrofuturism mean to you? Well, I think you guys have kind of covered a, a big portion of it and and it's true, it is a, a point of contention for a lot of my friends that a white man coined um, at the term. Um, but we've made it into what we wanted to make it into. I think there's just like a, a couple of things. Um, Afrofuturism is not a reaction to something, so it decenters this resistance to white supremacy or, or racism or any of that. It's, it really is just. I'm going to make what I want to make and imagine what I want to imagine, um, but not in a reaction to, right? It's, and uh, I think that that's really, really important because so many parts of our worlds as, as black body people tend to be a reaction to some sort of violence or harm or something that happened uh, to us. Uh, so that's really important. I really love that, you, um, Celia, that you said unapologetically we're about blackness. And, and that's one of the things that I found uh, having conversations about Afrofuturism in, for instance, South Africa, where white body people see themselves as African, so therefore they want to be part of that conversation. Um, not saying that they can't be, but I, I just really am very, very clear that Afrofuturism is centering black bodies. And for me, that can be very expansive. Um, blackness is, is pretty large, and it can include you know whomever identifies as a black person. But I specifically am saying black bodies because our world is reacting to this body uh, it, before we get to our mind, our soul, yeah. and all the wonderful things that make us wonderfully black. So uh, you know, with so whenever whites want to enter and want to kind of negate that, it's like you're kind of missing um, the point. And then the other thing, as well as two other things, spiritually, um, the spirituality of Afrofuturism is extremely strong. Um, I've seen in many courses and classes and people teaching who don't want to deal with that. Then you're not dealing with Afrofuturism and you're not dealing with blackness mm -hmm. because it's intertwined, you can't separate it, sorry. Uh, spirituality is it, it embedded in the blackness, in the black body, um, in the way that we live. And then finally, what I really love about Afrofuturism, it helps us to really take a hard look at time. Um, and, you know, I really love the work that Rashida Phillips is doing and so many people who are like playing with time. Many a corporate does that really well with language, um, moving in and out of time and how she describes like a paved road is just so beautifully elegant um, within this kind of more traditional space. Uh, so, you know, time and Afrofuturism, it kind of collapses onto each other. So past, present, future becomes these multi-dimensional multi kinds of realities that we move in and out of, kind of like in our daily lives, you know, because we can be imagining something now as we're, we're sitting here, we can smell something from somewhere else, right? So it's, it's, to me, it's a more accurate way of how we're existing and engaging in this reality. Uh, and, and that is really important. So when we say Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism, we definitely are talking, looking at black bodies in the future, but it's not a sane future to me as, as it would be in this very linear Euro-centered way of um, engaging time. Uh, and, that's really great because it's, 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 to me, a very healing way of existing, uh, so, yeah. Well, it's certainly liberating. You know? and yeah. <laughs> because I think what you're talking, I'm, I'm glad you brought up spirituality per se, because I think that um, 
what we're really seeing is reflective of a sort of separation from the like tradition, like Judo Christian, Judeo Christian traditions, mm -hmm. and the sort of the rigidity that's built in there. Mm -hmm. And you think about, you know, blacks who were brought to the United States, and blacks who originally were retaining their own spiritual practices that they had on the continent, mm -hmm. and how those things are very quickly outlawed by people who do not understand them, who didn't know, who didn't know exactly what was going on, but they knew that there was power there. And so that had to stop, you know? And so I think part of that is spiritual connections that are very different than what, you know, than what Christianity teaches. And it doesn't exclude Christianity, but there is an embrace of a more holistic mm -hmm. way of seeing the world and relating to the world, relating to nature, relating to each other. Um, and I think time, the way that we see time or don't see it is part of that. Because I personally, I believe that time is a construct. And I didn't say it before, but that is definitely a, a sort of core part of my belief system. And so to hear you say that, is, that's very fascinating. And on the subject of time, um, my next question is, when we look at global history, and in particular, the places where slavery and colonialism have shaped our legacies, what for each of you is the historical significance of black women's powerful participate, participation in sci-fi, futurism, and speculative thought? So that's, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> I know it's a big question. You asked the question earlier, and I thought about it, and it's like, my mind resisted it in a way. Really? It resisted it because it's, it's like, I would have to go through our entire history of being in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. I would have to go back through, across the waters, you know, over the Middle Passage, you know, through the Middle mm -hmm. Passage, um, to get, you know, to be, to do it justice, and I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I want to be in the future where we're free. Mm -hmm. I want to be in the post-colonial. Mm -hmm. I want to be in a space where we are complaining about our utopia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, so people that came to mind, of, of course, the, um, the amazing sister was playing trees, you know, in, you know, mm -hmm. in, in defiance, you know, they, you're risking her life to do this. You know, it's like only different people. We are always there. There is no moment, there is no act of liberation that took place anywhere in the diaspora at any part of the time continuum that black woman wasn't present. And I'm thinking about like a body of work that I love, I love magical realism, or the original term, the marvelous realist, that comes from a Cuban writer, Alejo Carpentier, right? And he was, he was a historian initially that was trying to write about Haiti and the independence movement. But when he started digging in and doing that research and doing that spiritual work that you was talking about and looking at it, he realized that the, the tools that he was given as a historian were insufficient. They were not enough to do justice to what took place in Haiti to create that, the, that successful slave uprising. He had to look at who do we. He had to look at the rituals and the things that motivated the people to take that risk and to risk their lives in order to be free at that moment in time. And it was a black woman who led that ritual, mm -hmm. okay? It was a black woman who did that. Um, so um, we are always there. <laughs> um, and I just, I just, I guess my mind got overwhelmed with all the moments in time. Mm -hmm. I could talk to about Harriet Tubman, Milo Hawkinson, and Upendra Mihan um, co-edited a collection that I'm in called um, So Long Been Dreaming, Post-Colonial Science Fiction and Fantasy. And that's a quote from Harriet Tubman. She was talking about that freedom that she had been so long dreaming of. You know, we are always there, you know. So I don't have any specifics um, in terms of um, our, our, our places in colonialism or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, just know that, it, you know, if anything was going down that was significant, <laughs> <laughs> a black woman was there. Yeah. And I'll just say, and listen to Zora, because Zora told you, Zora Dale Hurston told you, the mules of the world or what have you. But you, we, we are the ones that are, you know, that are gonna hold that, that, that glit, that stardust inside and try to move the, <laughs> move the culture forward. Mm -hmm. Even though we told you in 2016 what was gonna happen. Uh, mm -hmm. yes. And we're living that now. Black women told you. Thank you, I'm definitely like seriously, right? <laughs> hold the stardust inside, but they remind us that we are made of stardust. And so I think that that 
you know, the principles that I hold are, I think, are very uh, maternal, and I think it's really coming from watching and listening to like Adrian and all these, and reading um, science fiction by women, uh, that all of that came from, really. Uh, I'm, I'm full on inspired by uh, the strength of black women. When you're talking, the, the first thing that came to mind was this woman, I, I forgive me, I forget her name, um, but she was a slave, and she decided to escape, and she basically hid in this like kind of crawl space in a house. Karen Beecher Stone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was it was it Karen Beecher Stone? No. Was it say it? Jacob. Jacobs, Harry Jacobs. Thank you. Because it was a Harriet. <laughs> so I think I, so it's that it's, <laughs> not that
how radical indeed it is as an Afrofuturist storyteller for you to even tell a story about multiple generations. Coming from a perspective and as an American, from a place where you live in a country where at certain points, women in your family are forced to be sterilized. I mean, that in and of itself, that's astounding. And it really brings a lot of like more dimension to this to everything that we're talking about. I mean, just I just want to contextualize that a little bit for people because it's not just a matter of, I mean, creativity. The creativity within Black women and within Black women who are doing sci-fi and futurism is immense. But there's even more to it than you than you think. And and I do want to sort of bring that around and ask you both about how you think. That black, what is it that you think that black women uniquely bring to science fiction? And I'd like you to give an example of someone who you think is doing this in any media, any medium. I know there's a lot, but I just like to to so that we can get in your head a little bit. Uh, now I'm just so very conscious right now of my obsession. <laughs> I'm like, you always talk about this. You always mention this person. Think of someone else. Think of someone yeah, else. Yeah. <laughs> that was that one. <laughs> now I know to bring a list next time of people I don't normally talk about. Yeah. But just for the, in the interest of time, so that I'm not, you're not sitting here watching me struggle, um, I will just say um, the novel that comes to mind is Mindscape by Andrea Hairston. And the reason why I mention it because the first time I read it was was when I was working on Dark Matter. Um, but it was a big novel, and it was very difficult for me to think about how to excerpt it in a way that would do service to the work and, and also to the reader who's sitting down to read the story in, in one sitting, right? That's the purpose of a short story. Right? So um, I, I find out that Octavia Butler is going to be teaching at Clarion West. Mm. And I said, fuck all this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 I mean, I had been seeing it in, you know, Loafless magazine and all that, and you know, everybody in the mom said they went to Clarion West as a science fiction workshop, six weeks, you drop out of your life, you might lose your home or your husband or whatever, I mean, and your children might not remember your name when you return, but you're in Seattle for six weeks. Every week you have to write a short story, a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you get that new baby up to a complete stranger, 15 or 16 people from around the world. And a writer that you admire most, or an editor that you admire most, and they tear it apart. <laughs> and you go back and do it all over again. Um, but that, that was the model then, 1999. Mm -hmm. It has since become more holistic, and they don't tear it apart. They are there to build and create and grow, mm -hmm. so it's even better. But when I was there, I met Andrea Hairston, and she was working on that novel, Mindscape. Mm -hmm. All right? And the thing that struck me about it was that in her work, she not only managed to bring in all the, the power and the, and, the, and the concreteness of science and scientific thinking and this, the law of physics and all of that good stuff that, you know, hard science fiction right, right. Um, <laughs> and, and the three Bs are known for, um, the Fred Bear, Frederick and Fred, David Brin. Mm -hmm. um, but she also brought in um, black vernacular mm -hmm. and this idea that we are these multiple things, that you can have a black woman scientist who knows how to code switch, mm -hmm. okay? They, that they exist. I mean, I was sitting in workshops where people were debating me, like how can you have a person who's intelligent that speaks with a southern accent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? Real conversations, real conversations. Um, I had students when I was teaching at Frederick Douglass Card Center who came from major MFA programs in New York City who came to our classes because they were getting that kind of critique embedded language, of course, mm -hmm. you know, more eloquent language, but still very dismissive. And they were trying to write stories about us. And they weren't imaginary people. They were people that they knew. People who had a lot to share and give and had a lot of experiences, but they did not, they did not um, present in the way that traditional literature says that you're supposed to present to have these worlds. So she had characters who spoke German, who also spoke Yoruba, who were, um, um, fluent in spiritual practices that are often dismissed as suspicious or scary or what have you. All of this in the place where the world has been separated by four barriers. She did this before Stephen King wrote his Terror the Under the Dome book, I might add. Um, and 
And it was just astonishing to me. And I said, this is what science fiction can do. Mm -hmm. You can be all of these things in one place, mm -hmm. and it can it can make you think and feel and and believe. You know, that's what I wanted to try to do. Mm -hmm. So that's one person um, that does it. Um, in terms of visual arts, there are a ton of art, you know, sure. artists. Um, Krista Franklin um, out of Chicago, um, you know, just gives me so much um, inspiration. Um, uh, Wanagichi Mutu, 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 Wodegeche. Thank you, girl, because I was going to call her Geechee girl. <laughs> both, both. You know, um, the SARS, all of them, mm -hmm. all of them. Um, are just um, extraordinary, and I don't know, of course, if they would even consider themselves that. They're just, you know, but to me, it's very Afrofuturist in nature. Um, just um, Michelle and in Dave in Ocello, the mm -hmm. musician. Yeah. Um, I get all of that. Oh, they told us that they were taking their blood. Genesis, Mutu, Envy, Astronaut, Genesis, and Ballet Dancers. And Ballet Dancers. Yeah. And Asora, yes. Major music. Yes. Inspires you, and then we'll open it up to the audience because I feel like people got. Answered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sweet. So I'll just stick with one person. I love your list, so I co-signed that entire list. Um, <laughs> and all of them. Uh, so Nadia Korfor is one of my favorite, 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 favorite writers. I had the pleasure of presenting with her in Las Vegas, and that was like yes. <laughs> I try not to be too much of a fan. <laughs> uh, and I mentioned her before, uh, and I think the reason, because who fears death mm. is so, the nuances, uh, it's amazing. The love, the romantic story is unique because the woman stays in power and the man is there to really support and help her grow her power. Mm. What? Um, I'm like, can I get one of those? So, you know, it's, it, I think that alone was just the journey of that was amazing. But when you think about like Binti and other stories that she's written um, in terms of how she, how she um, brings in the tech, um, but still in this hyper traditional kind of African space. So people are still wearing their traditional kind of um, clothing, but flying a spaceship. Um, and then being self-conscious when being in space around other people about what they're wearing, like the dust from the desert or things of that sort. Uh, so it's the same kind of things. It's like we're, you know, as much as we may evolve within technology and science, our cultural traditions will still kind of remain intact. It's basically what she's saying. And the, they're still going to be possibly this way of when we're diversifying there can be tension. We may still have to, you know, uh, protect ourselves, guard ourselves, or not. It just depends on, on how we evolve. But to even have the thought experiment is really beautiful. I mean, and I just love the journey she she takes us on. So I want to add mine. Mm -hmm. Let me answer the question. Um, I want to. Well, so with Octavia Butler, who is a very easy answer, but I want to focus particularly on Fledgling, her last mm -hmm. work which was about a vampire who was in the body of a small girl. And I love the fact that I found that novel so disturbing. I loved it, it disturbed me, and I just, I didn't know what to do with it. You know, except I knew, I, could, I recognized the beauty of it. And there are many elements, it's a very complex novel, but I just, I think it was genius, the way that she was able to tie all that up and of course it was published after she died, so I couldn't even ask her about it. You know, I couldn't even ask her any questions. Um, in terms of visual art, I will say there is a there's an artist who is a British, an Afro-British artist named Lena Victor, Ooh, who yeah. does this really beautiful, these, these huge canvases, and all of her canvases um, incorporate gold. And as we know, gold is is an element that is literally is universal. And so that's why we send spacecraft up that has a gold album and other gold pieces because no matter where it goes in the universe, it will remain intact. Um, and for me, her work sort of captured the majesty and also the beauty and this other sort of cosmic element um, within an Afrofuturist um, context of imagery. 
And then uh, there's another artist who is a Canadian named Kaylin Michael, who's doing really, really beautiful work that is, she's a, she's a visual artist and also a graphic designer. And she does really interesting work. Some of it looks like collage and some of it looks more like painting, um, but she's speaking to a future. She's, she's speaking to a future where blackness is central mm -hmm. and where diasporic aesthetics are also integral to all of the work. And I think those things are really, you know, are really important. And just to touch on what you said about <laughs> the uniforms, about um, Okorafor's work and just this whole idea of maintaining or retaining cultural elements, there is kind of an assumption made, right, that in the future, we're all gonna have on these Star Trek, you know, one piece, these jumpsuits, and everybody's gonna have on this thing, and everyone's everyone's ethnic identity, all of their origins will be sort of erased, and we're all like in the future, which doesn't make sense. And for people of the diaspora, adornment is part and parcel of who we are. We, no matter where we are, no matter what part of the world we landed in, adornment is is central to how we present ourselves in the world. So there's no need, there's no reason to think that that would change in the future. It's really, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, enough of us, <laughs> or more of us, but with you. Well, first, yeah. if we can just have a round of applause for y'all. <laughs> Is, um, and you may have addressed this earlier. I, I was thinking a lot about Dahlgren when I was listening to mm -hmm. your comments and how Delaney made this world that was based on an anti-technological premise mm -hmm. and the barter system, including sexuality and all of that. But you know, how do we negotiate the non-fetishization of technology that's particularly Eurocentric or just whatever? But you know, like. In your comments about um, cryptocurrency, I keep, I, you know, I immediately think, who owns the servers? Who, you know, who, who owns the servers? Mm -hmm. Like, how is this a Eurocentric? It feels to me like a Eurocentric space. I've never felt invited to even know more about cryptocurrency. And so I'm interested. Yeah, I'm beside yourself. Your, <laughs> your singularity proves the point. Um, but, but, I'm, but I'm interested also in how it doesn't, it's not, you know, this fetishization of technology is also something that's deserving of questions, you know, like, just because it's new don't mean it is healthy. So I'm, I'm interested in the idea of the way that Delaney flips that, what's your comments on that, and and uh, particularly <coughs> sharing about, uh, Sheree, about your notions of Pan-Africanism and Afrofuturism. So um, the thing about it is that when I think about the future, and I think that one of the most science fictional concepts I can think of is an African continent with all of the nations completely being dedicated to their prosperity. It is completely reversing what is the present and what has been historic, um, at least since colonialism, um, reality, all right? So what we know of is that I can go to Iceland or float through Iceland or I can be in Belgium and they will celebrate their chocolate, but we know that there aren't any cocoa trees in any of those countries, right? Okay. I can go to Rome and I can have a delicious cup of Italian coffee and be reminded that that's not Italian coffee, that's Ethiopian coffee, mm -hmm. right? And then I can go through Somalia and hear people complaining about pirates. Oh my gosh, the pirates, the pirates. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> and realize that guess what? They are highly pissed, they are big, big mad because all of the things that make their country um, that could make their country prosperous are being, is being taken out. 
the wealth is being extracted, right, at their expense, and they don't see any of it. So, of course, if a Western ship comes through the port, they're going to jump on that joint because mm -hmm. they're not going to starve, and they're not trying to disappear, right? Mm. So, when I think about the future in the science fictional concept or the futures, I'm thinking about all of these countries. It's 55, right? 55, I believe, mm -hmm. including the new um, Sudan, right? Mm -hmm. right? These nations actually changing the economic, global economic system that requires their destruction, that requires their exploitation, that requires them to be on the losing end every single time. There's a country I want to visit, all right? Um, very small company, country called Gabon. Mm -hmm. I was told I'm gonna have to bring a whole lot of coins and bags of money because the French own the ports and everything that goes in and out they ex exact a huge price, and because oil companies have sat up there, you know, and most of those people have a lot of money that work there, so they're not really that upset about the price. But the local people who live there are just being, are, are just being, they're being soaked, you know. So I have resisted, you know, kind of going because I'm going to be a part of that process, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's a better way to get through there. But this idea of you have an African continent where almost all of the resources of the world are coming out, including the cobalt that we use for our cell phones and everything else, being mined by children mm -hmm. who are suffering, whose families are suffering, and that's okay with us as a world? Right. That's, okay as we, that's okay with us? If we change that and say it's no longer okay, and we make the moves that we need to to make sure that we are... We are more equitable and that we resist policies that depend on the exploitation and the destruction of whole generations, then that will be a, 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 one of the Afro futures that can have a rippling effect around the world. And we'll have a good diaspora. Too. Because they are a part of that voice. Each nation has to discuss what that looks like for them. They're gonna have it's gonna have to be a political movement in the sense that they're gonna have to change who their leadership is. Because the reason why it continues. Is because they have leadership that is that gets that siphons off some of that wealth and looks the other way, while the rest of the population suffer. What about people in the diaspora? How do we how do we participate in this process? Yeah. Well, it's not that different in the Caribbean. That's why so many of them are in the United States and Canada. I mean, if you're on the wrong side of the mountain, you're on you're on the resort side and you work there, but on the other side where there's no wind. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a whole different story. Um, there, there is, um, there's a lot of um, inequality that, that is fueling the way people are thinking about this philosophy of Afrofuturism. And so I can't come from America or from Tennessee or from New York or from you know, Oakland or whatever and go to the Caribbean or go to Europe or go to Nova Scotia or Edmonton and tell them my, what Afrofuturism is going to be like for them. They're going to be a part of that process, and they're going to shape it based on their historical experience, where they are, and where they, where they imagine it themselves, where they want to be, excuse me, in the future. That's why I say it's plural. Um, and part of that um, plurality is having a space where we can all share data, um, share what's worked, what hasn't worked, and discuss that. Um, I was just part of a project, and I'll just wrap it up, um, where we were talking about imaginative futures, future forecasting for a big corporation that you would not think would be thinking about future forecasting in this context. And one of the people there was a um, Norwegian uh, futurist who has lived through a lot of the things that he predicted when he was a young man. They've happened. And um, he's frustrated, understandably, because the, in Norway, they have benefited a lot from their uh, their practices from their socialist practices, but now after having benefited from it, they want to um, um, pull the ladder up, and they're doing it partially because their population is slightly changing. There are browner people coming in the country, and so now all of a sudden, oh, if if we look, raise the votes for for ourselves, their votes are going to rise too, and they don't want that. You know, we know that very well in America. That's the whole philosophy in our country, almost. You know what I mean? So he's watching this. This, this play out and it's very frustrating for him. And one of the things he kept saying during our project meetings was, 
ask Norway to do, come up with an idea. He said, well, we tried that, and this is what happened. We had to ban private hospitals in Norway so that we would have excellent health care for every citizen because there was the only one system in which you could practice mm -hmm. medical you know, mm -hmm. care and health. Wow. And so we would get all the excellent people, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone could benefit from it. But if you have a private system, then all they're just gonna siphon off the good people and the rich people are gonna be the only ones mm -hmm. who have the excellent care. So he had a lot of things that they've done. And this whole I Ask Norway is something that I would see us doing on this Afri African diasporic level of sharing information, what practices we have tried, what experiments that we have done, how it worked out, how it failed, and how it could be changed and adapted in all these different communities, using possibly ERSI um, and some of those other mm. um, science fictional works as, you know, modules. So, wow, that was a really beautiful journey that you turned us on, thank you. Uh, just thinking about how Africa has all the resources, but yet in debt to Europe. Um, you know, there's a beautiful uh, TEDx talk that somebody really points that out. Uh, there's absolutely no reason that Africa should be in debt to anyone, um, quite honestly, so resource rich. So um, your question, Dahlgren, uh, I definitely, a sign that Afrotopia uh, has a book club and definitely read Dahlgren. I thought it was a perfect book to read in a city like Detroit, where we're, it's super similar to the book. <laughs> to the book. Uh, not so much now, but definitely when I first read it, and I have yet to, to finish it. And if you don't know Dahlgren, it's like the Bible of sci-fi. It's like a thousand pages. It's like a million pages. <laughs> I'm at a one, no, I'm just saying. But I, <laughs> I, uh, I really love that book. So tech, technology. I've gotten to the point, I, I'm not, as I said before, I've only been in the tech industry actually under a year. Uh, I started in June of last year. So I'm a baby and I'm new. One thing I'm understanding is that we need more creatives in the tech space. Uh, we need more Afrofuturists. We need more people there, present, having the conversations with uh, the developers and the uh, engineers in the space, um, really helping to kind of expand the conversation. So what I've come to learn is that there's a lot of philosophy behind tech, and that philosophy is usually libertarian, um, this kind of radical free market kind of notions and things of that sort. That they feel that tech can just solve all the inequalities, right, and just go away, which of course is extremely laughable. Um, and this is why we need to be present. And this is why I do the work that I do. I know that it is white male dominant, uh, especially in the United States. And I know that they have these ideas of liberation and freedom um, which I think comes from a good place, but does not apply to everyone and probably won't necessarily work for everyone because they, they don't really want to shift consciousness. And that's what I always come back down to when it comes to tech and, and, and creating tech and participating. Unless we shift our consciousness, we're just going to repeat all these legacy systems. And it's just going to show up, right? Um, I do not think, I, I, I feel like we need to be in a balanced space. I, I, I like this idea of being with the tech and then you know, taking a break from the tech, but it's very difficult to get away from it. Plus, I think it's been very beneficial in being able to have these kind of diasporic kind of conversations connecting with, excuse me, with other people around the world. Um, and it's helped, because of the innovation of internet, it's helped us to empower ourselves. You can start a business on your own. You can do so many things without having to ask for permission, or you know, we, we don't have to wait for somebody to let us in and to have access, which before the internet, you know, if someone said no, that was it, right? Um, and so now it's the same with uh, trying to find a loan for a home. They're, they're trying to create these things in blockchain so that we don't have to deal with these third parties that they know is a block for so many people for, who want to accrue any sort of wealth or just power. Uh, blockchain technology was literally created with um, the mindset of 
making sure that I have ownership over my data um, and that I can have more power in my participation in an economic system. To me, that is something that black people have been searching for, um, this power in an economic system. And so this is literally experimentation. It's only been around for 10 years. So, you know, we're at a, a space now with EOS. There's many different types of blockchains. So it started with Bitcoin and now there's EOS. And it was literally created to, um, to really look at how can we create another type of, not just economic system that has no violence, harm, that does not extract and exploit human beings, but also what is a new governance system. So it's the first blockchain that is governed by people and that's why I work with this blockchain because I really want to know what does it look like for the people to govern an economic system. Right now, literally people sit in a room, usually white men like in Bretton Woods uh, right after World War II. They literally, the United States gathered their allies together, all white men in one room, sat down and said, hey, Basically, the USD is going to be like the global currency. You're going to use it to buy oil and things. You're going to have to convert into USD to, to get access to X, Y, and Z. They literally decided this and then were forced to participate because the trickle down effect of that, right? What I love about blockchain technology is that all of us can sit in the room and say, we're going to create our own token and it's going to service X, Y, and Z with the inflation, we're gonna put that pool of money aside and then we can create a grant making system. Um, we're gonna decide how it's gonna use, what its value, where it's going to, where who will accept it, everything, literally everyone is in this room. And that's a decentralized autonomous community. And that I think really is in line with a lot of the, um, I think imagining of what it means for economic power. Um, the redistribution of economic power and political power for black people. Uh, so, you know, as much as the tech has its issues with cobalt and things of that sort, and that's something that I talk about all the time, like I'm addicted to my iPhone, I have no idea how I'm gonna give it up, but I know that in order for this to exist, children mind mm -hmm. for resources for this. I don't know what to do, right? Um, I think this is our attempt to try and do something else. and. I don't think that this economic system that is extracting and exploiting will ever really go away in our lifetime. But what we can do is create parallel systems. So for me, it's all about options. And that's the problem. The people have never had options in an economic system. We were always regulated to this one. It's a cryptocurrency allows us to say, mm -hmm, I don't want to participate in that system. I'm going to participate in this one or that 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 one. There's over a thousand or more uh, cryptocurrencies. So you get to choose which one you want to use. I like that, you know, the, it's the options and our ability to, to really co design our own economic system according to our needs is really important to me. And, and this is why I work in that system. And, and that's why I'm inviting all black people and women to the table. And that is also, <laughs> you said something about not feeling invited. And that sort of strikes me about something, again, that is inherent to Afrofuturism, is that you don't need to be invited. You know what I mean? If you recognize the, the, the power or the ability for that technology, or that system, to work for you, then it's about just doing it. And so even if that means create, taking it and creating it outside of whatever everybody else is doing, it's just doing it because in the current context, if it's something great and good, you're probably not going to be invited. You know, I mean, and just getting back to that quote about there is no capitalism without mm -hmm. racism. It's, it's just, I mean, it's a competitive game. And I think that's really exciting. So we just have a little bit more time. Um, we received a question from Twitter. Sure, great. Um, and also, uh, I think I'll ask this question from Twitter. We'll get somebody in the audience to ask their question, and then y'all can kind of choose which of the two you want to answer, if you want to put them together, but we just kind of have time for okay. one, so I'm trying to like pack two into one. Great. <laughs> so uh, Terry B, uh, at Terry B Designs Co on Twitter, who's a black woman and design strategist in Detroit, asks, what can Afrofuturism mean for my business? Uh, and then does anyone from the audience want to add, it doesn't have to relate to that question at all, uh, but a question, okay, I got one back in the room.
gave Sandy Lee King her an honorary doctorate a few years before she died from when our class was, and it still brings me to tears because, of course, she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> and she understood it as an environmental justice statement and a political statement. And, and at graduation, she said, you don't know how much this means to me to be honored, to be loved, and be shown love by your own means everything. Mm. That was the question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad you brought the red one too. But I think one thing that we need to put on the table, I just got back in the last 36 hours or so from Belgium when I was speaking last week. And it's funny she mentioned it, because we were in the, the room Carnet de Palais, which is the, the after King Leopold, who met to divide up Africa mm -hmm. and to disperse the commodities and the resources among the European states. Mm -hmm. And we lived with that, and I think we had a very big say, for at least 120 years. And it wasn't until like the sort of really changed um, telephones. I mean, in the night, early 90s, if you wanted to make a call between Kenya and Uganda, that call went to Paris. Mm -hmm. All those calls mm -hmm. went back through um, Europe, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that technology has changed us. And if you think about it, you get the implications of what I'm saying today. So, and the thing I want to talk about, <laughs> we have to put knowledge of the doctrine of discovery because all of this rests upon what those two popes, Leopold, no, 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 wrong, Nicholas and Alexander, one was the fourth, one, one was the fifth, and one was the sixth. I never remember which. <laughs> but in 1493, they issued a papal doctrine particularly to Spain, the monarchies in Spain and Portugal. And the output of that was to say to Henry the Navigator, to Vasco da Gama, and all of those dudes, I have a piece that is a divine directive that any people we encounter, and the people were plural, we have the authority to enslave them and to take all riches that we find in any country and take it back to its rightful place as directed by God in Europe. Now that is just a plain, flat out, racist based, <clears throat> not a political statement as much as it is a, a financial one. And we need to understand it and it's hard, cold. We have lived as in the last four or 500 years as a result of that. And that needs to be on the table because then I will stop. <laughs> what part of my message was when I was in Belgium last week. We need a whole lot more truth-telling up in here. Mm -hmm. And until we get some truth-telling, I mean, the Haiti Revolution, Henri Cassatt, Toussaint Louverture, and Dessalines, they made France tail their tails under their butts and leave. The Louisiana Purchase was not a brilliant thing that Thomas Jefferson created them. It was a fire sale. So we need to put some, it was. France was anxious to leave. And so we need some perspectives that we haven't brought to our youth, to ourselves, over too many generations. The ambassador from Haiti came up and kissed me after I said that at the UN. He said, I didn't know anybody in the United States understood that. Mm -hmm. But the people in Haiti understood it, and they understood even when George Washington Williams, the first black ambassador from the United States, who was the ambassador to Haiti and who was a historian, put all that together. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> for dropping the knowledge. Yeah. Um, I think that with regard to Afrofuturism now, and with regard to telling stories and creating toward the future from a black perspective, the, the, the path definitely is a foundational element of that. You're going to have a much richer understanding of the future if you have an understanding of where you come from. And so certainly in this country and in the West in general, but especially in the United States, we have an issue with education in the sense that it does not exist in a truthful way in this country. Despite the monies that may be poured into it, or actually monies that are not poured into it, it is not doing what it's really supposed to do. It's not doing what it says it's, what it says it's doing. So, but that does not <coughs> preclude us from creating in the future. And I think that um, black women are exceptionally adept at doing that. 
I think that, you know, gender notwithstanding, Afrofuturists have a way of dealing with what we have right now and what we know right now. Even, and sometimes we don't necessarily know the history, but we can feel it. You can feel when there's a falsehood around you, when you're living in a falsehood. Take that and take the angst and the, the annoyance and the discomfort that that can create and create your own future. As Cherie said before, she didn't want to answer that question about historically what black women have brought because she wanted to deal with the future. And that's what Afrofuturism does. It's a, it's a pathway to do that. Because you can create a future that includes history as it existed or not. And I think for people who have been saddled with the history that black people have been saddled with in this country and in the West and on the continent, um, there is great liberation in that. Not to be in denial at all, but to, to free yourself because I, I find that what happens here oftentimes is, and I mean, I think many of us have had the experience of as a, as a student, you get to, you know, how black people are dealt with in American history, and it's the one picture, little lithograph of Christmas addicts, and then it's slaves, and that was it. And it's always sort of talked about, it's kind of hushed, you know, sort of like it's a shameful thing. And I think many black kids have been made to feel shameful about it. The reality is people who enslave other people should be ashamed. That's where the shame lies. And so if you're coming from that, and that's sort of been your grounding, to be able to say, you know what, as you said, F all this, I'm, I'm doing something from a completely different perspective. That is liberation. That's one kind of liberation. It's not the only kind, but it is one kind of liberation. It is, absolutely. It is part of flipping the script because you are taking that weight off. You're just brushing it off and going forward. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't change history. Yes. I just, I just, every single day, you woke up and you put on a TV and you walk around and you're supposed to work every day. And I think that also, then we also have Afrofuturists who are incorporating the past, who are knowledgeable of history and take the strength of the past and the strengths of black history that aren't necessarily taught in school and using those to craft a, a future that is built on authenticity and truth, that's coming from an organic kind of evolution. And I think that's something that, you know, a lot of Afrofuturists are very, very skilled at and that's why that genre is blossoming in the way that it is. And I think that as the sort of nurturers of everyone in this world, black women are particularly stars at doing that. Um, I think that, you know, that is something to celebrate, and I'm glad that we've been able to talk about it, and I'm getting that nod, like... <laughs> On that note. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much to you, and we invite you to join us uh, at 5.30 at Iowa Writers House. We'll have kind of food and beverages, and if you want to pick these guys' brains a little more one-on-one, -on -one, you can do that there. So. And I just thank want to quickly so say thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, Celia, for putting You're this welcome. together. And thank you to for the Center at African Afrofuturist uh, Studies <laughs> for existing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>